Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning and we thank you that your word is a light unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord, and we just pray that you would uh, put your light on, the, on your word this morning. Use Pastor Izzy, Lord, to speak to each one of us, Lord, and we just pray now that we would lay all of our cares at your feet, Lord, put our, our eyes and our attention to you, Lord, as we can, that we can receive and be strengthened and encouraged as we gather together to study your word. We ask this now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we got all the way through verse 7 last week, 1 Corinthians to verse 7 of chapter 4. We saw Paul was telling the church at Corinth to not look at him as an apostle in any um, high regard, just rather just as a servant. He said, you want to regard us as anything, just regard us as slaves, really, slaves of Jesus Christ and stewards of the mystery of of, of God, this wonderful mystery of salvation that he has given through his son, Jesus. So Paul, Paul had a really good head on his shoulders. He had, by this point, you know, that he's writing the letter to the church at Corinth, he had ministered for many years, he'd gone on missionary journeys, and he, I think he had seen what happens when people, you know, some people start to worship the leaders. I hate to tell you this, but they actually do this in some places. They they get so into the, oh, we're we're a follower of this guy or that guy, and and you know, but that's not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church, not not a man. And so, guys, there's nothing new under the sun. That was happening back in the church at Corinth. They were, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, you know, I'm of Peter, and and. Paul says, guys, Paul was not crucified for you. Apollos wasn't crucified for you. See, you know, Peter, did, we didn't die for you. Jesus died for you. So put your eyes back to him. And so this is the part we jump back into today. In verse 7, we saw that they had kind of gotten an attitude of, well, we're, we're, we're special. <laughs> I don't know why some Christians get that way, but they think, you know, God... God needed them on their team or something. He was picking up teams for dodgeball, and he said, I'm going to get all the good players on my side. And so he picked them and called them to be on his team and his family, and they get us this, this kind of attitude of, good thing God has me on his team, you know, because otherwise uh, we wouldn't win the game, you know, because I'm so good at dodging the ball. And God's going, that's not why I picked you. You know, the Bible tells us God chooses the what things of the world, the foolish things of the world, to confound the wise. I always remind people that's my qualifications for why I'm the minister. Not you know, somebody go, how did you ever get the job? Because God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He does. He he does not need fancy things or or you know real polished things. In fact, I think he likes to just show off the more the more rough around the edges the the, the instrument is that he's using, everybody is sure it's not the guy. It can't be Izzy. I mean, look at him. He's messed up. And yet God keeps doing miracles. And, and then they know who the credit really goes to, to the Lord. That's what he wants. He does not like to, I don't like those glory grabbers. You know, there's some of those preachers that think God really chose them because they're special. And he needed them. And, and, the, and, and it only happens because of them. They're so great. That's baloney. Let me show you this. Paul goes on to really drive this point home in the rest of this chapter. And we see it here in verse 8. He says to the Corinthian church, he says, well, let's, let's just reread verse 7. He says, for who regards uh, you as superior? What do you have, he says, that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast uh, 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 as if... You, you had not received it. You act like you just you're so special. He says, but you. He said, you you are already filled. You have already become rich. You become kings. Paul says, without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings, so that we might reign with you. For I think God has established us apostles, last of all, as men. He says, condemned to death, because he says, because we become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. 
It says, we are fools for Christ's sake. But he said, but you, you Corinthian church, he says, you are prudent in Christ. He said, we are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, Paul says, as an apostle, he says, we are both hungry and thirsty. We're poorly clothed. We're roughly treated and we're homeless. By the way, if you ever feel like, oh, I don't know if God even knows what it's like. I, I, I'm down on my luck. I'm homeless. Let me tell you something. Jesus was homeless. Jesus said, the birds of the air have nests. The foxes, they have their dens, their holes. He said, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And his own apostles, here's Paul the Apostle saying, look, we're homeless. You know, you know some people don't, they, they think if you're homeless, you can't possibly be used of the Lord. But our Lord was homeless. And the Apostle Paul himself, right here in the Scripture, declares he was homeless. So a question, can God use a homeless guy to get his message out? Sure. There's no, you know, to the Corinthians, they had it all. They, they were living in, in, a, in a society that was, we'd just say, overflowing with, you know, abundance. I mean, they were, they were, they were in that, in that trade route, they had people coming and going. Their commerce was going on. They were, what we would say, in that day, they were the rich of the day. And Paul recognizes, he says, you guys are rich. You're filled. You have everything. W we go hungry. We serve the Lord, and we, we're just, we're, we don't have it. And look at what Paul goes on to say. He says, to this very present hour, he says, um, he says verse 11, we go both hungry and thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, and we're homeless. And he says, and we toil, we work with our own hands. And when we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. Do you think Paul ever got persecuted? Yeah, you read the book of Acts, you know he got persecuted. He says, when we're slandered, we try to conciliate. That's like uh, we try to answer kindly when they slander us. I'm still working on this. I've had guys slander me. I, I have a Sicilian side wants to do something else to answer them, you know. How dare you? Like to like kind of knuckle print them right here. But um, not Paul. He says, when we're slandered, we, we just answer kindly. He says, and we, be, we have become the scum of the world, the dregs of all things until... You know what dregs are? Dregs are the... When you, when you, those of you that never ever saw... A wine making old style you know when you grow up in an Italian household you have at least one uncle that stomps grapes in the bathtub <laughs> or some some crude bucket or something and they just smash them down and and to you know to release the juice out of the grape but all all the yeah, between their toes and all the all the leftover mash it it, uh, it begins to ferment and start the fermentation process from this from the, the stuff on the outside of the skin gets in now to the, ju the sweet juice and starts fermenting it into wine. When you're all done with the process, though, they take the, the fermented top layer. The, the, the solids all sink. They, like, go to the bottom, and they get nasty. Has anyone ever had to clean out the dregs at the bottom? You know, the stuff, that the, the slimy grape skins that, uh, and, and seeds and pulp that, that begin to rot. Now you pour off the top for, to, to bottle it and make it into a wine, but the bottom of it is gross. And this is what the very word Paul says, you guys are really rich, have need of nothing, and got it. you're polished, you, you're like kings. We are like the scum of the world. You know, pond scum. We're like the dregs, the bottom of the barrel. We're, we're like nothing. Now some people say Paul had a bad self-image. What do you think? I don't think so. I think he actually had a real healthy outlook. He recognized that he was, you know, when it came to sinning, Paul, Paul said, I am the chiefest among sinners. He was actually out killing Christians before he was converted. He was, he was not a nice guy. And yet, he said, to whom much is forgiven, they love what? much. He learned that from Jesus. Jesus said that. Who much is forgiven, they love much. 
Jesus told that to Peter one day. Who loves more, the guy who's forgiven a little or the guy who's forgiven a great debt? Peter said, I suppose the guy, I suppose the guy who's forgiven a great debt. If some people ask me, why do you love the Lord so much? Because he forgave me a lot. Okay? And I know it. Any, anyone else can give an amen to that? You know the Lord has forgiven you. It's a great feeling. But see, to someone who has not sinned much and they haven't been forgiven much, they're like, well, you know, it's a good thing he has me on their team. Because, you know, I was pretty much already in good. Just had to forgive me a few small indiscretions. I don't, I don't know how to tell those people, but it only takes one sin to fall short of God's mark. To miss the mark is only one sin in the, in the books is all it takes to get, keep you, you know, from, from hitting the target, the bullseye. And so you can't act like you're better than the one that sinned a lot or a little. You still miss the target. You cannot, you cannot claim righteousness of, uh, of your own. We have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your righteousness. Because I can't do it. Now, Paul, Paul didn't have a bad self-image. He just had an image of really... I'd call this a healthy self-image. He knew he was nothing. In this world, he's nothing. But listen to what he goes on to say, just to show you that he's not... Listen, he says, I do not write these things to shame you. He says, but I write them to admonish you. As beloved, what? Children. As beloved children. He says, for if you were to have countless tutors in Christ... He said, yet you would not have many fathers. In, 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 for, for in Christ Jesus, Paul said, I became your father. I became your father through the gospel. And therefore, I exhort you, be an imitator of me. He says, for, for this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, Paul, this guy, I think he has something going for him that a lot of Christians need to take note of. He recognized that he was a sinner. He recognized the full working of God's grace, that he was what he was by the grace of God. But he also recognized that Christ loved him so much as a sinner that he said, I accept you right where you're at, but I'm not leaving you there. I heard Pastor, uh, Pastor Mike Kessler this morning on the radio when we were coming. We were praying for him. I turned on the radio, and right then he said, and some of you may have heard this saying that, that Christ loves you so much he, he accepts you right where you're at in life. All the flaws and everything. But he loves you so much, he's not going to leave you in that low state of all those flaws and all those crummy habits. And He loves you so much, he will love you out of those things. He will help you to grow and leave that junk behind. I thought, that's so true. You know, the Lord, does the Lord love us that much that he died for our sins and said, I forgive you. They're washed away. But I love you so much, I'm not going to leave you in that crummy place that you're in. I mean, that'd be cruel, wouldn't it? I forgive you. Now, good luck with the rest of that. Figure it out on your own, right? You'd be like, what kind of good news is that? Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you what? More abundantly. Now some people interpret that he came to give us eternal life and then tacked onto that, the more abundant part is that extra help he gives us from when he receives us in our lowly estate and now pulls us out of the hole we're in and the hole we keep digging and he keeps lifting us, you know, so we finally get out of the hole and start to run on, on the path and then he begins to guide us through this life, and that, they call that abundant life, his guiding in this life. Now, I've heard it taught the other way, and by the way, I don't have the answer for this one. I looked it up in the Hebrew, the Greek, could not figure out which one goes where. If the abundant life is eternal life, and the life he came to give us is the life now, you could interpret it that way, or they flip the other way. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, some guys actually argue about this. You go to seminary. I call it cemetery. It's a great place to kill your faith. You know how many people go to seminaries thinking, I'm going to go to serve the Lord, and they come out going, I don't believe in the Lord? Because men wrangle over words. And the Bible says, don't, 
Don't be around those guys that wrangle over words. It leads to the ruin of the hearer. We're not, I'm not here to wrangle over. Look, you guys get the idea, right? We get eternal life, and we get Jesus to help us in this life here. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm with you, lo, until the ends of the age. I got gotcha. you. You're covered. Now, Paul, Paul says something so cool to me. I wonder how many of us could say this to a church. He says to them, guys, you know, I'm not really anything, but there is one thing. Though you had a lot of great teachers and tutors, you'd only have one father. Father in the faith, so to speak, you know. And he even called Timothy his son in the faith. So he must have led Timothy to the Lord. And, and in another passage, he says, there's no one as like-minded as this young man Timothy was. He just, he, Paul, Paul really saw that he caught the, the, the message of, of what Christ did, that gospel of grace. So there's no one as like-minded. And so Paul is going to send Timothy to this church, this rich church. We say rich in, in materialism. Okay, they're, they're wealthy. And he's going he's gonna to tell them, look, you guys, I, he's going to remind you Timothy is going to remind you. Now, what's he going to remind him of? I want you to look at verse 17 carefully. Because what if someone was going to remind <laughs> some other church about you? Okay, fair, right? They're just going to go, Dawn, you're up. We're going to send someone to remind the people in another church on the mainland about your, about your faith, your walk, your manners, the way that you conduct yourself. The way you've shared about the Lord. You're going to be just the example, okay? No problem. No pressure. I mean, anyone want to volunteer for this? We can use Tim. Tim, we're going to use you as the example. They need to know how to do Jesus. Listen to what he says. For this reason, I'm sending Timothy to you guys, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of what? of my ways which are in Christ. He's going to remind you of my ways. Not, he doesn't say my teachings. He says my ways, my manners, my way I behave. And, and he says, just as I teach everywhere in the church. He doesn't say he's going to remind you of the doctrines which I have outlined so that you might have all the points doctrinally correct. No, he says, I'm going to have him remind you of how I act, my behavior. So that, so that, listen to this, so that you will, what? Just as, just as I teach everywhere. He, what? He says, you're going to, he's going to remind you of how I act, because that's how I teach. By the way, this is how all teachers should teach. You want to know how to do this Jesus thing? Copy how I do it. Not do as I say. Not as I do. That does not float with, with the scriptures. That would not line up with this. Paul is actually saying, I'll send Timothy to you because he'll remind you how I act. And that's how I teach. I teach by my actions. Actions speak louder than words. You want to know how to do Jesus? What did Paul say? Be an imitator of what? Of me, as I am an imitator of Christ. How many of you could do that for someone who's just starting out in their faith? They're like, I'm so new to this. I just got baptized last week. How do I do it? And you go, don't worry. You don't know how to do it? It's easy. Just copy me. Everything you see me do, just imitate me as I imitate the Lord. You'll, get, you'll catch on. That's how I teach. By the way, is modeling a, a strong way to teach? I'm, I'm, here I am using Dawn, who's a teacher. You know, has a, is, does this work, Kate? She's got another teacher right there. One of the strongest forms of teaching that we have as teachers in our arsenal is example. People learn by example. And they need a model that, you know, if you're going to teach something, we, when I was a gymnast at Arizona State, I, I really quickly learned to always, when, when I wanted to learn a new trick in the gym, I would, I would find the guy in the gym who was the best 
at that trick. I wanted to learn something on the high bar. I'd go to the high bar specialist and say, how could I watch you do the trick? I never picked the guy that was the crummy guy and said, I'm going to learn from him. Or I'll learn what not to do from him. Forget that. You don't watch the wrong picture when you're trying to learn to do it right. You don't need to see someone crash and burn and go, yeah, well, that's what you don't do. We have plenty of that in life. I need to see the person who's doing it right. And I would always pick out the guys that were the best at, at whatever event it was, whatever trick I was trying to learn. I'd go, maybe one guy's like, they go, well, he's, you know, Mike Pena, he has the best Dutch hand. You've got to just learn from him. He's the only, I mean, he just flies when he lets go. Of the, okay, Mike, can I watch you? I just sit there and watch the guy who was the best at that trick over and over because I learned real quickly that if I wanted to be able to pull it off as good as the best guy, who am I supposed to imitate? The best guy. And if somebody is learning the faith and they don't know how to do it, how many of you could say to them, look, it's okay. Just imitate me. As I imitate the Lord, I'll just show you by example. I know it's some people need Jesus with skin on, so to speak. They need someone they can see doing it. So I've been following him for a while. You just copy me. As I copy him, eventually you'll catch on. You won't even need me in the way because you'll just see right past me to the Lord. But you're just new at it. So here's, we'll get you started. Paul said, Timothy will remind you that this is how I taught. How many of you think it would be pretty cool to watch Paul the Apostle teach? I mean, go back in time if we could and see this guy, how he taught the Lord. I, I, I go, this guy, and he was schooled under Gamaliel. He was one of the, I mean, as far as intellect goes, Pharisee of Pharisees, he had down the scripture. But he didn't, he didn't use that as the thing that he was going to say Timothy will remind you that I could quote all of the book of Isaiah. Or Timothy will remind you that I have down the whole Old Testament law. Or that I have the title Pharisee. Of, no, he just goes, Timothy will remind you how I, of my ways. How I acted. So that I could teach you Jesus. That's my kind of guy. That's the kind of guy that for me... That's the kind of guy I want to find. The guy who's able to say, and, and by the way, this really does cut out a lot of baloney. If the guy is saying, okay, you can just copy me as I copy the Lord. If you did that for somebody who's just starting out in their faith, would there be anything you wouldn't want them to copy? Would you be going, um, you can copy me most of the day, but there's a couple hours I need you to just, like, Go on a, I don't know, Ross run or something. Go to the Walmart. Because uh, there's a few things I do, not really what you need to learn to do because it's not really. If you, if you even thought that for a second, I, I just helped you identify areas of sin in your life. If there's something that you have to say, no, you shouldn't copy this because it would be a shameful thing for you to, that's not, that's not Jesus then you just figured out how to improve your, your spiritual walk. See, because this is a very healthy way to assess where we're at in the Lord. Can we say, just be an imitator of me, like Paul did? Even though he was not rich in this world, even though he was persecuted, even though he was slandered, even though he considered that he was as low as the scum, the dregs of the world, he said, yet yeah, I'm still your father in the faith. And I can show you how to do the Jesus. Just imitate me. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.